So many people might think that even to mention science and religion in the same sentence is oxymoronic. But is it really? That's the topic that I'll attempt to unpack for us today. My first experience with science started at a really early age, when my father would take my brothers and I outside on clear starry nights to look at the stars and the moon and the planets. Clear starry nights were a somewhat rare occurrence in the rainy Pacific Northwest where I grew up, so I have especially fond memories of those nights. Gazing at the heavens, I began asking the big questions in life, the same ones that humanity has asked ever since the beginning of time. Questions like, where did all this come from? How big is it? How long has it been here? Why are we here? How will it all end? And one of my personal favorites, is there anyone else out there? Starry nights do that to us. They make us think and feel and wonder about life's big questions. Growing up in a Christian home and coming to faith at an early age, I always believed in my heart that God was the source of all this wonder. But I went to secular schools all the way from grade school on through grad school, and I heard over and over again in my science classes that the facts of nature had absolutely nothing to do with God or religion. But if God was who he claimed to be as the creator of the very universe that I was studying, how could the truth about God contradict the truth about his creation? So my quest to reconcile science and faith began at a pretty young age. In the middle of grad school, I started working at Lockheed on NASA's Hubble Space Telescope and the International Space Station programs. And before long, I was designated as Lockheed's corporate astronaut. I went through literally hundreds of hours of simulation and training exercises, including getting my pilot's license, participating in neutral buoyancy simulations in gigantic water tanks, and flying on, KC, on the KC-135 research aircraft, which is affectionately, and I might add accurately, known as the Vomit Comet. <laughs> After that, I spent some time working on programming of the Bellagio Fountains in Las Vegas, which is not as far removed from rocket science as you might think. And after that, I spent some time at the RAND Corporation working on Air Force studies. I also did some consulting on other NASA projects, including the Crew Exploration Vehicle and the Mars Exploration Rovers. More recently, I've been teaching science at Azusa Pacific University and really focusing on the connections between science and faith. Not long ago, right after news broke of possible evidence for gravity waves in the cosmic microwave background radiation, I was asked to write an op-ed article for CNN's belief blog. The CNN editor provocatively titled the piece, Does Big Bang Breakthrough Offer Proof of God? In it, I mentioned that science was a tool that we can use to uncover the wonders of God's creation. And the public reaction was nothing short of astounding. The article went viral with over half a million views in less than a week, 70,000 shares on Facebook, and it was in the top five worldwide most shared news stories on social media. On top of that, I received tons of email, mostly positive, but peppered with a little hate mail just to keep things interesting. And one person even got a hold of my personal cell phone number and called to give me a piece of his mind on the matter. This experience made me realize just how polarized people can be on the relationship between science and religion. In fact, I would say that the illusion of conflict between science and religion is primarily perpetuated by fundamentalists at opposite extremes of this dialogue. On the one hand, we have religious fundamentalists, and on the other, atheistic fundamentalists. People that are so thoroughly entrenched in their own positions that they are not really capable of stepping back and thinking about their perspective from a critical point of view. These two extreme positions give rise to the perceived conflict, 
between science, which people tend to associate with godless evolution on the one hand, and religion with an almost magical view of sudden creation by God on the other. But the real conflict is between scientism, which is a combination of natural science plus a secular worldview, and creationism, a combination of Christian worldview plus a strict 21st century literal Western biblical uh, perspective, especially with regard to six-day creation. So perhaps what we're seeing is really confusion or conflation of concepts that don't necessarily go together. What I mean is science can be successfully practiced without a secular worldview, just as Christianity can be faithfully practiced without a six-day view of creation. I would like to suggest that there's some fertile middle ground for dialogue between the two that bring together voices from both science and religion. If God truly is the creator, then he will reveal himself in what he's made. And this isn't just my take on this issue. A recent study showed that 61% of American scientists self-identify as Christian. And many famous scientists believe in God as the creator. This quote from Einstein is one of my favorites. Religion without science is blind. Science without religion is lame. And he also says, I want to know God's thoughts. The rest are details. Now I'd like to go over a few key pieces of evidence to help you understand why these brilliant scientists would believe in God. First of all, modern science arose in Christianized Western Europe. Michael Covington writes that Jews, Christians, and Muslims, all monotheists, believe in a creator who made an orderly, rational, understandable universe and gave us permission to investigate and utilize it thereby legitimizing both science and technology, as well as paving the way for modern science. On the other hand, atheists can't explain why it's even possible for us to understand the universe. As Einstein wrote in 1936, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. Furthermore, the great thinkers who are instrumental in creating the modern scientific method, were all devoted Christians. The next piece of evidence uniting science and religion is the Big Bang. The Big Bang model of the universe, which is based on evidence that the universe is expanding, is much more God-friendly than the models that came before it, such as the steady state model. The Big Bang model states that there is a beginning to the universe, and by cause and effect logic, a beginning necessitates a cause or a beginner. Other models, such as the steady state model, say that the universe always existed, so there is no need to explain a beginning. Also, contrary to popular opinion, the Big Bang was not a chaotic explosion, but rather a very highly ordered event requiring vast amounts of information. Stephen Hawking wrote, if the rate of expansion one second after the Big Bang was smaller by even the tiniest amount, the universe would have recollapsed before it ever reached its present state. Another prominent scientist, George Smoot, describes the creation event as finely orchestrated. One of Hawking's associates, Roger Penrose, showed that the highly ordered initial state of the universe is not something that could have happened by even the wildest chance. When Fred Hoyle calculated the probability that carbon would have exactly the required resonance just by chance, he said that his atheism was greatly shaken, going on to say, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics. And science historian Frederick Burnham had this to say about God and the Big Bang. The idea that God created the universe is today a more respectable hypothesis than at any time over the last 100 years. Another piece of evidence comes from biology and studies of the origin of life. 
Just a single living cell contains as much information as 30 volumes of an encyclopedia. Origin of Life scientist Walter Bradley says, the mathematical obs, odds of assemb assembling a living organism are so astronomical that nobody still believes that random chance accounts for the origin of life. Even if you optimize the conditions, it wouldn't work. If you took all the carbon in the entire universe and placed it on the face of the Earth, and allowed it to react chemically at the most rapid rate possible and left it for a billion years, the odds of creating just one functional protein molecule would be one chance in 10 with 60 zeros after it. This is approximately the same odds of a thoroughly shuffled deck of cards being dealt out one specific suit at a time in ascending numerical order. Next, let's look at the teleological argument. The teleological argument is probably the most commonly discussed argument for God's existence in today's technology and science fixated society. This argument claims that the design and order that we observe in the natural realm point to a purposeful creator behind it all. The teleological argument goes hand in hand with the Goldilocks principle, which points out that just like all the just right things that Goldilocks found at the th Three Bears house, both the earth and the universe have a long list of characteristics that are just right for life. The earth is not too hot, not too cold, not too big, not too small. Our gravity is not too strong, not too weak. Our atmosphere is not too thick, not too thin. Say it with me, it's all just right, okay? And the list goes on and on. If any of these characteristics were off by even the smallest amount, life would be impossible. Even though thousands of extrasolar planets have been discovered outside of our solar system, and perhaps 10% or more of sun-like stars could support planetary systems, all of our space exploration so far has shown that none of our neighbors in space are remotely capable of sustaining life of any complexity. If the Earth is just the result of some cosmic lottery, surely we could find something that could be improved upon. But when we look at all the special characteristics of the Earth that make it habitable, we quickly realize we live in a pretty unique and improbable place. To change any of these essential attributes would be to decrease the likelihood of life existing. And we see evidence of this life-friendly design not just here in our solar system, but throughout the entire universe. For example, if the mass density of the universe were greater, the universe would collapse back onto itself because of gravity. If the mass density were lower, there wouldn't have been enough density of matter for stars and galaxies to form. The critical mass density of our universe is fine-tuned to one part in 10 to the 15th power. And that's like a blindfolded person picking the one marked penny out of a stack high enough to pay off our national debt. That's a lot of pennies. <laughs> there are to date over 300 of these life-friendly, finely tuned characteristics throughout the entire universe, and the list is continuing to grow. The probability of occurrence for all of these exact parameters is about one chance in the two, 10 to the 280th power. That's like the odds of one person buying just one lottery ticket for each drawing and winning every time he or she played twice a week, every week, wait for it, for 50 years in a row. Most statisticians would say that probabilities of anything less than one chance in 10 the 50th power are not just improbable but statistically impossible. So in any case, to say this is extremely unlikely is an extreme understatement. So overwhelming is this evidence of life friendliness in the universe that currently the main counter argument to the involvement of some kind of intelligence is the multiverse hypothesis. The multiverse hypothesis speculates that there may be an infinite number of additional universes, each with a different set of physical laws 
And our universe is perhaps the only one among all of them to just randomly get all the numbers just exactly right so that life can exist. Of course, so far, there's no real way to either verify or falsify the, the existence of additional universes. So the multiverse hypothesi hypothesis doesn't really qualify as a scientific argument. But even if we concede the possible existence of additional universes, they still all rely on the existence of some set of orderly physical laws. Now, I was going to refer here to another one of my favorite scientists, who's kind of like the Super Bowl MVP of theoretical physics. But unless you're Dr. Sheldon Cooper or some other Caltech scientist, you probably wouldn't be impressed. So I'll try to explain the gist of it myself. So to paraphrase Dr. Paul Davies, the life friendliness of our universe is extravagant, way more than what we need, and certainly way more than what we'd expect if it were all just due to random chance. Also, multiverse explanations still assume the existence of physical laws, so they offer no explanation as to why space, time, matter, and energy all behave in orderly, consistent patterns, instead of having utter chaos throughout the universe. The last part of his quote is too good to pass up, where he says, finally, invoking an infinity of unseen universes just to explain certain features of the universe we do observe seems the antithesis of Occam's razor. It is an infinitely complex explanation. And remember from philosophy class that Occam's razor says that simple, robust explanations are more likely to be correct than complex ones. So to wrap all this up, the perceived conflict is simply not real. We have evidence from science and scientists who have faith. There will always be people at the radical extremes of the dialogue. However, I believe that science and religion complement rather than contradict each other. If each are understood correctly, they provide us with a wonderful meaning place for rich conversation and perhaps mind-altering dialogue with each other. If you find yourself still wrestling with life's great questions, then maybe the best thing you can do for yourself is to become a science enthusiast and increase your understanding of the wonders of the universe. After all, properly practiced, science can be an act of worship in looking at God's revelation of himself in nature. If God truly is the creator, then he will reveal himself through what he's created, and science is a tool we can use to uncover those wonders. Thank you.